Let's start. Uh, do you hear me okay in the back? Okay, thumbs up. That's good. Welcome everyone. We have a good lunch. Today to, to learn something uh, about automated release pipeline and fired up. That's good. Uh, I'm uh, Evi Kalsta and this is my colleague, Anna Ding. And uh, our topic is taking our automated release pipeline to the next level. So in this uh, session we're going to first start with some concepts about some basics, we won't spend much time on that. Uh, then we will talk a little bit about the topics of how you implement our release pipeline and how we can take it a step further by not only talking about the deployment but also the whole service life cycle. Uh, then we're going to talk about deploying to multiple clouds, Azure and AVS in this case. So before we get into the demos, we're going to spend some time on a little bit of theory on our thinking behind the design of the, the solution we have for the demo. Yeah. So yeah. So for the the concepts, I guess uh, most people in this room is familiar with most of these uh, concepts. Uh, the DevOps that uh, Jeffrey talked about in the keynote, uh, our release pipeline, uh, where we have infrastructure. It's uh, a code defined as a template in a source control such as GitHub. We have continuous integration with our build server. We're going to tell you what kind of tools we have chosen for this demo and, and why. Testing, of course, high availability between between our is our deployment deployment to two different clouds, so you will see templates for AWS and for Azure. And we also chose to use containers, so we will touch a little bit of some. Uh, Docker images and uh, use Docker for not only hosting the application but also for deploying things from the build server. Yeah, so first, something about implementing an automated release pipeline. Uh, just a few pointers on uh, what you should uh, think about doing that. Of course, the first thing that you will need to do is to define the process that you want to automate. Um, uh, and if you're lucky, you don't have any only established processes, so you can pick and choose. And it goes for the next uh, step as well, choose your tools. There's a lot of different tools that you can use for deployment, uh, different languages, different clouds, whatever. And uh, at some point, you have to make a decision on you know, what you want to use. Uh, sometimes, though, uh, you are bound by all the established processes in a company. Uh, perhaps they don't have a source. Sorry. Only to have a source control system in place and stuff like that, which kind of limits your options, but uh, you just have to work for the uh, And of course, the, the most important thing uh, is to automate. Uh, and if you have already chosen tools uh, and mapped out the process you want to automate, and, uh, in this case, it's a release pipeline. Um, try to, to just automate step by step. Uh, sometimes you may have a requirement uh, that makes it impossible to fully automate. It could be um, an approval step or, or some, something like that. Uh, so, <coughs> as I mentioned in the beginning, we're trying to take it a bit a step further, not only thinking about the deployment, but also when something is going to change. So in uh, contrast to traditional IT, where a developer might log into a production server and perform some changes uh, directly there without going through source control, so we don't know exactly who did what. That's uh, kind of what we want to avoid by using this, uh, this principle. Also what we try to implement in our release pipeline is the failover process. So failing over from uh, one cloud to the other, something we're going to cover here. And also the termination, because a service has a life cycle, so termination of, the, for example, one version of the service or the service itself, it's also very important. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to go through the, the demo, the case scenario that we are going to show you. Uh, so what we are going to do is go to deploy a cell phone to GitLab service with the cloud. That's, uh, that's uh, the scenario, the goal that we need to do. Uh, right. uh, and then we have some, some specific goals that we have predetermined that we want to achieve. Uh, and we want an automated deployment, uh, but not, not only an automated deployment, but also something that automatically changes management for us. 
uh, on the infrastructure. Uh, it has to be simple, or relatively simple to manage. Uh, and we need automatic updates, or security updates for operating system and uh, stuff like that. And we need automatic failover. Further monitoring, which is a pretty interesting So, that's pretty much uh, enough about the uh, general concepts and NIS. So, I'm going to uh, show you some uh, videos. Just, uh, just a quick note. Uh, just sitting and watching on the training screen for 1 to 10 minutes is uh, not being uh, too much fun. So we have already deployed the infrastructure. We did that uh, 5 minutes ago, probably, 2 minutes ago. Uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm also going to talk before the demos a little bit about the technology transfer uh, for the clouds. As I said, we're using Azure and IDS because we were with those on the node. Of the, of the Lambda, and for the operating system, as I mentioned, we use containers. So I've not worked a lot at the customer the last, last year, I guess, with the containers and Linux. So we chose to use this experience there and use Core OS, which is a small, very small Linux distribution focused on hosting uh, containers. For source control, we use Gitter. Um, and for the continuous integration, we started off using Actware because that's what, what the new one of the experience with. Uh, but uh, when we were going to spin up our uh, Linux container, where we have the management tools which will perform the deployment, uh, it didn't support the uh, Linux container, which is what we use there. And because the build server was running Windows Server 2016, and as far as I know, it doesn't support Linux containers. Yes, like Windows 10 does. Uh, so that's why we just uh, switched to the certain CI, which is uh, a very similar service. We have a uh, portal that's pretty, pretty much the same, and the same concept that you can put a uh, configuration file so that you have very narrow upgrade.yaml. In certain CI, you have a circle.yaml with similar settings. So you can configure all of the certain CI. Uh, configuration inside of that, that file you don't have the necessary configuration in the portal if you don't want to the only access there I think is uh, um, credential that is stored securely in the, the other portal but the rest is just stored in source control in your file As for the automation tools uh, inside of the management docker container that is running on certain CI uh, we are using Azure CLI 2.0 for performing actions against Azure, such as deploying templates, making updates to Azure DNS, which is what we use for the uh, public DNS service uh, for the test domain. Uh, similar for AWS, we use the AWS CLI to deploy the virtual machine that is running there. Azure DNS, because, because there are good automation support from the CLI portal and we knew it, like we did with the GitHub, with those things we are familiar with. But you could also use the, the 53 or whatever that like supports automation via some, some form of uh, API. Uh, for monitoring, we chose to use uh, uh, application insights in, uh, in uh, Azure. So there you can set up a web test that will monitor the availability of your URL. And if that fails, you can do actions such as send an email notification or call a web test. So that is what we're doing here. We call a web test that will trigger an upper automation render that will perform actions to save away from one cloud to the other based on the settings we have in our configuration file. And then we have Docker for managing the con containers. We have two containers here. One is our container management image that we run both and testing locally and from the Circle CI server. Uh, and the other one is running the application in this scenario, which is the instance of GitLab, just to have something to deploy to show that the that is the application. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the implementation uh, based on the choices we made and uh, design. Uh, so we, of course, use templates. Uh, we always want to have stuff that we can check into the source control. Uh, for the infrastructure in Azure, we use our templates, of course, and for the other stuff, it's, uh, it's cloud formation of templates. Uh, we also chose to separate the templates from, from the deployment. Uh, 
which means that we have the success parameter files for the different uh, configurations into the uh, template. So both uh, the R template and the cloud connection template go to the five parameters and then have a parameter file, so we have a separation between the different configurations that the template describes how the machine is uh, And then we, on top of that, since we use a 4 OS, that supports uh, cloud config. We have uh, a way of declaratively uh, set up the operating system. Means that we just have a YAML file and we define you know, whatever files need to be on the server and services need to run and uh, what things we need to do and stuff like that. Um, and then we also use Docker and launch scripts to make it all cross platform. So we actually have Docker launch scripts uh, to Linux, one for Linux and one for Windows. Uh, this is uh, the same thing, it just launches uh, the deploy scripts inside a container from wherever you are. It means that you uh, have full platform support. So it is the yep. And uh, we actually uh, uh, researched it uh, while working on the demo, uh, but we just didn't have the time to work. Uh, but it's something that we have uh, yeah. down that we didn't look into. So, just quickly now before uh, showing you some demos, uh, and I'm going to show you some more of the architectural skills. Yeah, just to give you some context and make sure that you're all following before we dive into the code and show you, show you all the things. Uh, so, on the left we have uh, the source control, where both the uh, developers and the uh, operators can commit uh, code or code reports and so on. Based on the trigger in source control, the build server will catch, catch it up and uh, trigger a uh, uh, build. So, based on the settings in the application or service side that we're looking to, uh, it will deploy and set the automatic testing in the application inside. So if it's uh, deploying, it will perform an incremental deployment to the R3, for example. So if the VM is already deployed, it won't make any changes if there aren't from the end of template. It will spin up a VM with 4 OS and, uh, and deploy the Docker image that we have set up in, uh, in uh, the repository. And uh, the Docker image will run GitLab on top. So the web application in this demo is GitLab, just a hosted instance of uh, GitLab. Uh, on top of that, we see on the right the uh, actual application inside that will run a uh, kind of ping test to see if uh, the application responds to the HTTP 200. If it does not, uh, if it fails, it will trigger uh, after a automation render that will flip the DNS in after DNS to the opposite cloud. So if the after VM is down, it flips the IDS and vice versa. That's kind of uh, the scenario here. So let's go ahead and look, look at some code. I think that was all the slides on theory. Yeah, it is. And, uh, and for those of you who are looking uh, to see some juicy PowerShell scripts, uh, you will be disappointed. Right? There's a very little PowerShell in both scripts. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a public uh, public uh, service, it's a public port for the developing thing. It's just a simple uh, web test we tested with uh, which code. Now no, we, no. we could we could of course have uh, have done that in the uh, end of more thorough uh, tests. So but uh, this for this demo we had to, to limit ourselves. Uh, we are coming back to some of the other limitations in this demo. Uh, but yeah, we just wanted to show you a proof of concept. Get you thinking about what's, uh, what's possible. Yep. We have we uh, haven't set up anything uh, outside of what you get from the cloud platform itself. Uh, but definitely, for, for any production system, you should set up additional monitoring. 
No, we we haven't done that, but it's uh, it's uh, fairly possible to to do monitoring. Uh, both uh, Azure and AWS have the potential. Uh, I think it's already monitoring stuff on CPU and network and this. So, so, so yeah, so we get that. And if, if you want any further stuff, then you will need to, to write something or configure something to connect inside the container. Because uh, CoreOS is just the OS and it's running the service in a container. So the operating system itself is very minimal. And um, you will see when I show you the, the, the setup of CoreOS, it's not much there. It's uh, very, very small. Any other questions? Feel free to interrupt and ask. Very good. Alright, so... Let's start. <laughs> Start to just see. This is actual, of course. Uh, there is the, the deployed resources in actual. Uh, just a couple of words uh, on the deployment model. Uh, we support three different deployment models in this uh, And there's a uh, single cloud deployment, which means that we will deploy just to one cloud. Uh, and then we have an active passive mode, which is lower. Both clouds, uh, you have a passive cloud, so it's also cloud to both. And then you have an active active, uh, where you can deploy both clouds and, and both resources are active. So that's, that's the scenario that we are showing you today. Uh, and, and the reason is just the type of constraints, because it's easier to do things on the remote cloud. But we, we control everything to our own cloud. I'll show you in the middle how we control the cloud. Yeah, yes, they are. And I don't know if uh, if you've been to one of those container talks. So, so what we do here is of course volume mapping uh, from from workers. Uh, that's one of the limitations that we do not have today. We don't have a uh, data store, but of course in in a large environment you would need that for, for the data. But we have set up the, the volume mappings, um, and that's why we chose the use of propose. Have a clear way of describing our, our environment and then we just choose the mappings that we want. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there is a do you remember the language? No. Yeah. Luster FS. Luster FS. Uh, if you know that, that's, uh, that's something you have to spin up yourself, but it's pretty much a uh, file system on the internet. So you can map up to the machine. Uh, we haven't tested it, but we are certainly planning to do that and see how much overhead that adds to the service itself. But uh, that's probably the way, one way of, of going. Uh, but of course, if you set up, we are doing multi cloud, which of course makes it harder. Uh, but if you are setting it up in, in multi cloud only, that is something to be Yep, any more questions? Then, uh, yeah, just want to show you that we have the resources deployed uh, in, uh, in Azure as well as in AWS. So, the stack is stack, great to be, but uh, it's a bit of Yeah, there we go. Services of the link. Um, so, just going to go through a bit. Should we do the, uh, yeah. So so now we see that uh, that the service is up and running. Uh, at this point, it is not supporting active activity. We don't care what side it's going on. Uh, it's it's running on Azure. Yep. And uh, one way of proving that to you is of course to shut down the the VM. So I'm just going to go through a little bit about uh, how we structured the code here, the project. This is of course the uh, 
could have solved this in the help of course. So one of the, the main things here, of course, is that we have these are the uh, the wrappers, have one for PowerShell and uh, one for Bash. And the only thing these uh, these scripts do is just call the Docker container um, and uh, run a voice script put in that container. That means that we have the possibility of doing this on Windows, on Linux, Mac. Whatever. As long as you have Docker installed, uh, you can run the deployment of this stick. And we also, of course, have the this is the server's uh, YAML file that uh, sets up the continuous uh, integration service. And the same thing, deployment, just is exactly the same thing. We just run Docker uh, with the deploy. And uh, since we needed to deploy to Google Venture and AWS at the same time, um, we decided to make our own image. So that means that we, we started with a Docker file, which in, just takes the Azure CLI image and just installs AWS CLI. So, uh, <clears throat> so that means that we have one image with both CLIs installed. That we can run in, uh, in that. On top of that, we have a config file. Uh, and this is how we uh, we control everything. Uh, and basically, it, after you have deployed and set up the whole thing, this is the only file you need to change. Or... Yeah, this is just a JSON uh, that I've that we just created a config file based on JSON, <coughs> just because it's uh, easy to parse. So, so here you have, you can see we can control the mode, the project now, it's from the set back to active. Uh, we also define you know, which is the active cloud. Uh, and we can define stuff like automatic failover, and we can build, and so that, that's for the, the build server. So that uh, we want to do the changes, we don't want to get notified every time we have a full build, we want to do some more changes. That's um, and what we do is we define the resources we want to, uh, to include in the deployment in our in an area. In this instance, it's just a GitLab server. Yep, I mean, I've been shown in there, but it's, uh, it's not implemented as code. So, so the deploy script, it just reads the variables it needs from here, and it puts the resources to just deploy to the cloud based on the mode and that. Um, just quickly going to go through the uh, set of the cloud pumping that we use for the core OS. It's, it's quite uh, quite simple. Um, but also, you have not uh, seen this kind of uh, configuration file before. It's, it's basically a way to clear up here. Just uh, define how the operating system will uh, to look uh, after the deployment. So this is this is injected into the VM and then run the deployment. Uh, so we uh, define uh, some windows there. We make sure that Docker is started, of course, and then we, we download and install Docker Compose. Uh, Docker is already installed in the OS, um, and we make sure that we run Docker Compose to get our system up. That's it. Then the other thing we do is just have the Docker Compose files with the files. So that's what the Compose is installed, it will find the file and update the system. Well, no, this is this is for four of us. This is uh, given to the templates, as uh, you will see now, the templates, both AWS and Azure templates, support using their custom data and using data. Uh, parameters that are injected to the Linux machines to deploy them. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, that's meaning uh, using this one. And then we need the Linux machine, which is the system being used. That's all right. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is what we can do as well. It's really basic, just one service. Uh, but it 
we would have both Rails and Rails admin. And uh, everything will pull up as well. For topics and how you see the, the volume topping, this course would be mapped to the proper system data store. Uh, at least it's a good new cloud performance. So that's a good kind of thread. Uh, now we have password. We're going to. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would not do it like this in another project. This was yeah. just because, uh, I don't know if you've set up GitLab before. The first thing you get is a web page where you have to set the root password. I just didn't want that, so I would do that for the set. And this is something that we will really don't care about. So, it's a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. And, and all the other uh, secrets that we have, we have the authorization to post cloud, which of course defined as uh, secrets in the CI server. And we get them automatically as a right now. To, you know, so, yeah, so, so this is uh, basically two uh, templates. That's kind of a drawback working with, uh, with two different clouds, is that they have of course, different templates. Uh, formats that you have to deal with, uh, but uh, that's kind of just an initial uh, worry. You can set it up the first time, and then first you do it. So this is the uh, the template for setting up a colorless Linux virtual machine in Azure, uh, and the same for in in Azure uh, There's there's one thing that I'd, I'd like to point out. Uh, I always try to templates as clean as possible and just do lots of parameters so that we can reuse the same templates for different stuff. Uh, so for in this instance it should define how our core OS machine looks in Azure for our purpose. It shouldn't say anything about the security rules, it shouldn't say anything about mainly uh, any kind of dynamic information I do not want in the template. Uh, that means that I have Separated out the, the specific deployments uh, into parameter files for, for Azure. It looks something like this. And this is where we define the name, the size of the machine, and the username, you know, the network most connected to it, uh, the SSH key, and also all the security rules for the network security are defined in here. Because I might want to also deploy a test server based on the same server but with different names and different rules and stuff like that. Uh, and that's actually a gotcha that I like to make you aware of but that's not possible in the AWS uh, cloud which just a private file there don't support uh, which objects as well. Uh, and that's kind of a bummer because that means that in the AWS template we have hardcoded the security rules in the pipeline. I hate that. Um, uh, yeah, so of course we have the, the scripts themselves. So uh, this is what my deployment script looks like. It's all bash. <laughs> so uh, we, we discussed uh, different ways of, of doing this. We briefly tried to run our uh, Linux. Yeah, it was not really as level as we'd like it to be, so, uh, so we just uh, ran for the easy solution. That was just uh, the bash script to Linux. If I had a little more time, I'd probably do a bit more of a pattern, but it's both the AWS and Azure device, or basically, it's not uh, sure a lecture of my match to work with. So this, this works. So, uh, yeah, we, we don't have to go to the details there. It looks like to the course, the available wherever we have the details in the EU report. Look at the result. And uh, I also have the one book, so we can uh, mention. Some 
if you want to talk a little bit about yeah. how we set up the failover. I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, no, uh, well, it's just one build stuff. That is from the build screen. Some kind of old token CI. Yeah. yeah. So we could, of course, have broken down but to come pick up this look there, uh, then I just uh, change the settings in the, in the JSON file to true for the automatic build and automatic failover. It people triggered a uh, build here. So I can see all of the steps that was performed. I uh, first uh, started the container with the management uh, for operating system, then it uh, ran to, to the test that were written for the test or basically just validating the configuration file with it. They haven't written any other test yet, but uh, if that is uh, passing, it will actually run the deployment to Docker to, to the bugs based on uh, the configuration file. But I wanted to show uh, the failover configuration. So if I click click here, you can see that the Azure VM is still down. So I click click on the application insert setup. So we created an instance of application insights. Uh, this is something that you can use to monitor applications on a much deeper level to uh, monitor code execution time on much more sophisticated things, but we just used it for uh, um, availability. So we set up an availability test here, where you can see that it has failed uh, during the last 20 minutes. Uh, if we go into the properties of that HTTP test, we can see how we configure it. It's just a URL ping test, so it will go to the URL of our GitHub instance. Uh, here you can set the frequency, you can set test locations, so you can choose many locations in the world where it should uh, test from. You just throw it to a closest one. Uh, and here is the criteria, if it's too HTTP 200, it's a success, so then it won't do anything. And here you can define what the failure is. So we said that if it fails in one of the locations we define, within a period of five minutes, it will send us an email and it will call this web group that will uh, actually call an after automation web group that will do the switching of the DNS. So if you go back to the uh, code here, you can see the run group. So it takes the webhook data, if you work with webhooks in after automation, you recognize this. So here we're just parsing the, the input sent from application insights. Uh, so here we're reading uh, alert specific uh, properties, such as alert context and alert status. So if the alert status is that it was a failure, we will do an action here. So here we are uh, importing the prerequisites. And we are, we are actually cloning the Git repository using uh, the GitLib2 module for reading the settings from the configuration file so that we only flip the DNS based on the settings in the configuration file. Uh, I use regular protocol for getting credentials for Azure because the Azure DNS was hosted in uh, our DNS was hosted in Azure, so we have to authenticate the Azure. Uh, and here we just see what is the uh, the current IP address for the DNS names we configured, and if the alert was activated, we will take an action and uh, uh, switch the DNS from uh, after to the AWS or vice versa. So this is just regular PowerShell using a switch statement based on the current cloud environment. So here it's removing it and replacing it with the opposite cloud DNS IP address. So, if you look into uh, that, should actually have run. Also, you can just have a quick look here to see if you can uh, run it.
So within five minutes, uh, it should have, after having turned off the virtual machine in Azure, application inside should detect it and trigger this uh, run boot. There you can see that it's actually starting right now, so we'll let you with the timing then. <laughs> Uh, for the input, you can see that they got the webhook data, that's an automatic thing for the webhook in Azure Automation, where it will get in JSON format the, the values from the application. And if you look at the output, you can see that the... Uh, uh, forget. Okay, this was the second one, it's fired up. It application inside also uh, triggers when uh, the site is back up again. And then the... The uh, alert is uh, uh, restored, and then the run book doesn't take any action. So, if you look at the previous one, you can see that it uh, did the failure mm -hmm. already. So, here you can see that uh, uh, the uh, alert was right, taking action, mm -hmm. and here we just dump the context. So, this is all the data we get from application inside. I just dumped it just to see what the exception was and stuff like that. Uh, and here you can see that the deployment is currently running on Azure, so the run book figured that out based on their DNS name and their result IP address. And there it's replacing the DNS report from Azure with the one from AWS. Uh, so now, questions? Yeah, so it's an active active. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we're using uh, DNS hostname. So uh, the run book is using the hostname, and not the IP addresses. If we resolve them, then obviously we don't need any static IPs. So we can see here that it changed the uh, DNS from uh, this to this. So now we can see if we go into Azure DNS for those that haven't seen it. It's just a regular DNS tone that we can manage from Azure Powershell. So here we store the domain names for AVS and Azure. So this is the one that the run book reads out to flip it. So here you can see that it changed it from the Azure IP to the AVS IP. So if everything works, we should hopefully see a little better now. Okay. So that's basically the configuration or how or, or how the automatic failure reviews, but uh, as we mentioned, we of course doesn't have a common data source, so this is a separate instance of GitLab, so for it to be kind of a production solution and not just a proven concept, we would need a shared data for the network files as well. Yeah, any more questions on, on the demo? So, to start here, so that's a little bit. Um, it, this is kind of the boxy stuff, and, uh, and it's uh, it, it tied pretty well with some of the things that Jeff has said in his keynote about uh, the strong changes. We are going from Kubernetes to Kubernetes, we're going from silos to DevOps, and uh, traditional. Uh, IP and and the host of that kind to cloud. And, uh, I think uh, as of the people, uh, we just have to accept the embrace that we need to start to treat the process as well. Uh, to keep the right behind and, uh, and see uh, stuff as well as that. And that of course means that we have to do stuff like we're showing now. Templates, you have to use uh, anything that you can uh, describe and put it in a source control. And, uh, and the other thing is to try to see uh, the service lifecycle as a whole. Uh, I often see in the like this, there's, uh, there's uh, a demo how to deploy stuff, and it stops there. And, uh, and I think it's important to try to look a bit further. Also try to automate the rest of the lifecycle in the uh, and, and one way of doing that, the way we have done it, is by using this app, copy, JSON file, 
uh, which basically is the, the helpful version that happens in the Kubernetes pipeline. So if we were to uh, implement uh, this is a automation dynamic, we can have that as a setting, or if it would have put us in the remove in the resources array, it would automatically detect that it's all to remove, and then it's very good to bring it up. So, so don't think just for me. Um, as you've seen, uh, there wasn't much PowerShell in here, and, and many of you may be disappointed by that, but uh, I strongly believe, and I know that Microsoft also believes, Microsoft does believe, that uh, you need to expand the tool set. Uh, it's very saying that in the PowerShell context, but knowing PowerShell alone is not good enough. Uh, you need to learn Python and Bash. Linux, as well as Windows, you need no Docker, containers, and there's a lot of stuff that you need to know. And uh, it might be daunting and be a challenge to get to embrace all that, but uh, that's uh, exactly like the other thing, it's a principle to change, to convert, to be with people. But uh, it's hard to utilize more and more, and this is the reality. Of it. Yeah, it's got the open source systems so are getting popular, governing on Linux, so they also need to be deployed. And if you can't do it, you can hire some of this guy to try to deploy it. So it's better than you. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to end with, you know, automate all the things. Because it's kind of the PowerShell of Linux. Uh, because batch script is more like the batch files, the old uh, batch files, uh, and Python is at least a popular scripting language. Uh, so it's if you if you have to choose one additional language besides PowerShell, I'd probably choose Python. Yeah, and it also runs on Windows, so you can you can sit in your Windows machine and uh, while learning and testing. Something that we discussed making them up, that we should uh, create an additional abstraction layer uh, that we have to translate between them. Uh, but time is not up for us. So, uh, but it, they are, you know, both JSON uh, and have the same kind of stuff in them. So I think it's doable, but I, I can't say that. In this scenario, we try to use the, uh, the, the management tools for running from a container. So, what kind of CI service we chose really didn't matter that much, and then it's supported running Linux containers. So, we just try to do that because it was the first and best one to be honest. Uh, but I'm sure you can run exactly the same container from any other field server, Jenkins or whatever. It's super pretty easy because you make the management experience uh, pretty portable when you have it inside of a container. So it's like bringing a VM into the middle of the all the tools, screens, that's the idea. And that's why we chose to use container as a kind of the platform that doesn't really manage all the requirements we have. And that is a lot of that way. I think it 
som om Not there yet, but we'll upload it during the day or tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Our contact information on the line. Yep. Yeah. Just reach out if you have any questions. Either mail or mail. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.